Hello YouTube and welcome to an all new Elder Scrolls lore video. Today on the Elder Council of the Cyrodiilic Empires. Now, many of us have stood in the Elder Council chamber in Oblivion and wondered who sits on the council, what power do they have? Well, I'll try to explain that here and I will end the video with an interesting bit of speculation. This will be a needlessly complicated political video, so you've been warned. Alright, let's get into it. So, the Elder Council of Cyrodiil. As will become clear in this video, the council has served multiple purposes and has taken various shapes over the years, ever since its foundation back in the first era during the Alessian Slave Rebellion. To give this video some structure, I will first talk about the council as we see it in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, where we can actually see the council chambers and where we learn quite a bit about how it functions from both the game and from the lore. Then after that I will talk a bit about the council's origins and the different forms it has taken over the years and some historical developments. And finally I will end with a bit of speculation on what the council may look like and who may be on it during the fourth era. So the third era under the Septims, that's the first one. Now by the time we actually see the council chambers in the third era in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, it is formally a council made up of people who were directly appointed by the emperor or empress and advise the emperor on policy matters. Meaning that there are people from around the empire in it with a lot of per political experience, a lot of political influence or other valuable qualities to aid the emperor. There were 30 members, seemingly, in the third era as there are 30 chairs in the Elder's Council chambers. but. That might not be the full story, as High Chancellor Orkato mentions both an inner council, which does the day-to-day -day tasks, and then a full council, which is convened after the Oblivion Crisis in the lore, meaning that there may be far more members than 30, if that 30 is just the inner council, which runs the day-to-day -day operations. Anyway, during the Septim days, their official task was to manage the policy details of the Emperor in his name, within the framework as established by the Emperor. The Emperor would make policy decisions and then the Council and the leadership of their chairman, the High Chancellor, drafts laws in detail and administers taxes throughout the Empire within the Emperor's framework and allocates budget for projects just such as infrastructure, with the Emperor holding a veto over everything if the Council does something in his name that he does not like. So as a concrete example, the Emperor could say, we need to improve the infrastructure connecting Cyrodiil to Valenwood. And then the Elder Council, with its policy experts appointed by the Emperor himself, chooses which roads to improve, which people to hire, etc. If the Emperor disagrees with what the Council does, for example if the Council chooses to invest in water infrastructure by digging a new canal after he said that the infrastructure needs to be improved, but the Emperor wants to build a road, then the Emperor can veto the Council's decision and instruct them to build a road instead, or take control of the process himself if he doesn't trust the Council to do its job correctly. As such, the Council functions as a sort of modern-day cabinet of ministers of sorts to the Septim Emperor, and they are supposed to vote on new emperors to accept their legitimacy as they ascend to the throne. This is supposed to be essentially just a rubber stamp of confirmation, so a routine confirmation of the new emperor, um, but that's just officially. Because unofficially, the Elder Council is more than simply an aid to the emperor, and they often have great power in selecting the new emperor. While advising the new emperor is officially their task, the council tends to have a lot of political power and during the Septim days it was often a political power struggle between the council and the emperor. You see, during the Septim days a lot of the politically powerful people of the empire found their way onto the council and sometimes it was hard for the emperor to dismiss council members who had been on it since the times of their grandfather, as often council members, once appointed by an emperor, would be kept on by the next emperor and their combined influences of these long-term magistrates could sometimes overshadow young emperors, meaning that the council could sometimes wrest a lot of influence from the emperor. For example, Empress Kataraya, who was a Dunmer, never truly felt accepted by the council and traveled a lot throughout the empire to solve local problems and be away from the council who just tried to bully her. But this meant that the council ran the empire as a whole in her absence and gathered a lot of power for itself, meaning that her children inherited an empire that they could barely run as the council would be able to overrule the emperor on almost everything, without the emperor being the rubber stamp on the council's legislation rather than the other way around. 
Now, during the Septim days, an interesting case was that of Emperor Uriel VI. You see, Uriel VI was crowned a boy emperor at a very young age, and the council essentially ruled in his behalf for his entire youth. A power that the council would very much like to retain, as they could rule essentially without impunity. By the time Uriel VI came of age, however, the council had stripped the office of the emperor of so much power that the only thing that the emperor still could decide on was whether, whether to veto council decisions or not. You see, the council was able to appoint emperors and even disinherit complete branches of the Septim family to the, of the throne if they didn't like that branch of the family, thus essentially just choosing their own emperor. But Uriel VI was quite a clever emperor as he used his vetoes in a strategic way and used the imperial family funds to bribe and bully the council into submission until after six years of power struggle he'd vetoed, bullied, bribed and basically married off some of his siblings to strategic allies until the council was in complete submission to him and he was able to rule Tamriel as a despot after basically six years. He was able to do this because in the Septim days the Emperor commanded a certain divine authority because the Emperor was the only one able to light the dragon fires and protect Tamriel from the dangers of oblivion. Because of this the council could not ignore an Emperor's veto and thus Uriel VI was able to take back control by exploiting his status and veto. This is important to remember, as when non-dragonborn emperors ascended the throne, such as the Longhouse Emperors from the Second Era or the Mead Emperors from the Fourth Era, the dynamic with the Elder Council kind of changes, as instead of a divine ruler, the council now battles a mortal man for influence, which, as we will see, changes the game a bit. But I'm getting ahead of myself, as that is another quite interesting case to talk about. You see, during the early Septim days, 82 years after the founding of the Empire by Tiber Septim and only like 40 years after his death, Emperor Pelagius Septim II rose to the throne. A lot of people on the council at that time were still people who'd been there likely during the reign of Tiber Septim himself, as it only been like 38 or 40 years. But the Empire was in debt, and Pelagius II used this right of appointment of the council to dismiss the entire council, which was filled with wise advisors, some from, again, Tiber Septim's day, likely, and instead allowed only people who were willing to pay large sums of money to the Imperial Treasury to serve as his advisors on the other council. As such, he solved the Empire's monetary issue, but he plunged the Empire into an era with increased mismanagement, as the people with a lot of money weren't necessarily the people able to run the Empire in the best possible ways. I want to tell these examples to show you how the Elder Council, while it has a charter outlining its official duties, has had different levels of influence and power over the years. When the Emperor is powerful, it could just be a rubber stamp and an advisory organ, or it could be a cabinet of sorts if the Empire Emperor decides to use it in that way, or even a tool to get money out of the rich. While when the Emperor is weak, the Council is able to exploit this and exploit its own position and rule the Empire without impunity. But it's a constant power struggle, essentially. However, over the course of its existence, the council has gotten an air of legitimacy to its power, and when the emperor is incompetent, or when there are no legitimate heirs upon the death of an emperor, the council is able to assume power over the empire temporarily in a legitimate way, and appoint regents and potentate rulers, regents in the case of a really young emperor, and potentate rulers in the case of there being no heirs. Something interesting to note here is that when Par Martin Septim sacrificed himself at the end of Oblivion and the Empire was left without an Emperor, we saw how the Empire did need an Emperor or figurehead at least to keep the Empire together. You see, we saw that the Council kept seeking an Emperor to keep the Empire together to the point that they appointed High Chancellor Okato as potentate who reluctantly accepted the position because he saw that they needed a figurehead and he was the only one with enough authority and enough respect by everyone to be accepted as the sole ruler. Uh, I made a video on him some years ago, so watch that video if you want to know more about High Chancellor Orkato. You see, this illustrates that while the council loves to rule without the limitations of a powerful emperor, it cannot function without an emperor or potentate as figurehead to keep the empire from tearing itself apart and as a central point of authority essentially. As when such a unifying figure is killed, either an emperor or a potentate, nobody really has enough influence to claim the throne or there are no heirs, at that point the empire just collapses and we get interregnums where everybody is fighting over power and influence, neglecting the provinces which often leads to the empire just falling apart. 
Uh, for an example of such an interregnum, we have the Storm Crown Interregnum, which is a period of infighting between the death of High Chancellor Orkato and the ascension of Emperor Titus Mead. I also made a video on that, which is in the description if you want to know more, just like the video on High Chancellor Orkato. Anyway, let's talk a bit about the origins of the Elder Council. Now, we know that the Council was first established during the days of Empress Alessia, founder of the First Cyrillic Empire, after she and her fellow humans rebelled against the alien elves who had kept humans as slaves. Alessia would rule as empress after this slave rebellion, and we know that her son, Belharz and Manbul, the only known Minotaur emperor of the empire, succeeded her and his coronation was confirmed by the Elder Council, which had already been formed at that point to advise Alessia during her reign. Uh, with that, the council's position of confirming the new emperor next to the dragon fires uh, being lit was started. An interesting bit of speculation about the origins of the Elder Council is that at this time it was likely a group of rulers and vassals from around the kingdom, uh, or the empire at that point, who hailed from a certain territory in the Alessian Empire and then just came to advise the Empress on their territories and pledge loyalty to her. What's interesting is that in the early Alessian Empire many of the vassal kingdoms which made up the empire were alien kingdoms which betrayed their brethren and worked with humans in their slave rebellion either because they also abhorred slavery or because they hoped to survive the conflict. This means that of the early Elder Council, it's quite likely that part of the council was made up of alien kings, which is pretty interesting in my opinion. Now, another interesting bit is that when King Riemann Cyrodiil founded the Riemann Empire, or the Second Empire, with the help of the Akaviri invaders, which had bowed to him after the Battle of Pill Pass, he allowed many of those Akaviri invaders on the Elder Council as his advisors, and there was a large Akaviri faction on the Council, with the High Chancellor and Imperial Battle Mage being an Akaviri, who, with the help of the Elder Council, even became potentate after the line of the Riemann Emperors ended. For more about that story, see my video on Akaviri Potentate vs. Duché. I know that there's a lot of video plugs in this video, but the video would be far too long if I've had to make whole diversions. But those are very interesting things to learn about, so check the description for videos on those topics, like for example also that Minotaur Emperor that I mentioned earlier. Anyway, a final bit of interest is that when the Longhouse Emperor Durkarak the Black Drake, which was a Reachman chieftain who conquered Cyrodiil, when he came to power after a long interregnum in which the council had gone defunct, he reinstated the council as an advisory body in order to embrace Cyrillic culture and to avoid getting the image of a barbarian conqueror. This means that acceptance from the council, even if the conqueror himself formed the council, can mean a lot for the legitimacy of an emperor, especially when that emperor is not a dragonborn emperor and thus does not have the divine right to rule. That actually brings us to the fourth era, as the Mede Emperors, who we see in Skyrim for example, also have to deal with the Elder Council. You see, the Stormcrown Interregnum, which started after the death of Potentate Oketo, was ended when Titus Mede I came to power by conquering the Imperial City, reportedly with less than a thousand men, after the Empire had become extremely weak after a lot of infighting in both the Council and outside of the Council, with a lot of people pretending to, you know, be the rightful heir to the throne while they weren't. And then we had a lot of pretender emperors and, well, watch the video on the Stormcrown Interregnum. Then on the council there was a man named Hiram, who was an influential member in the other council which had still existed by that point, be it very fractured. He was the one who convinced the Elder Council to accept Titus Mead as a liberator from the chaos rather than a conqueror, which the Council then voted to accept him as the new Emperor, and order and stability was eventually returned to Cyrodiil and later the Empire. But Titus Mead wasn't a dragonborn emperor, and from the Elder Scrolls novels, The Infernal City and Lord of Souls, we know that the Elder Council has a bit of a different position compared to the past. You see, under the Meads, it seems that the Council has become more of a parliament which votes on the Empire's legislation, which is made up of vassal kings and queens, influential merchants, heads of organizations, and others who control parts of the Empire. The Council no longer seems to deal with policy as the Medes actually have ministers, something which we hadn't heard about before, like they have a prime minister and a minister of war, which the Septims didn't seem to have. Those ministers now seem to take on the policy details, like which the council used to do in the Septim days, and those ministers are also appointed by the emperor himself and run the empire, while the council is more of a representative parliament who vote on laws and bring their local issues to the emperor's attention. This would make sense, as in order to sustain an empire not based on divine rule like the Septims, the Medes would have to take on 
more input from their vassals in order to keep the empire together and keep everybody happy as they no longer have the lighting of the dragon fires and their divine right to rule as a sort of trump card to demand everybody's loyalty. Now, in order to get loyalty from their vassals, they would have to listen to them and give them more of a say. And as such, this system where the Emperor's power is based on consent from vassals and not divine rule, which I derive from little hints we get in the novels and in Skyrim, makes a lot of sense in my opinion. But here's the thing, I'm in the process of writing my own sort of Elder Scrolls novel series set in the fourth era and while I only publish two of them online, uh, I'll give links in the description where I talk about them, uh, I'm in the process of finally finishing my final book and in that book I tried to give a bit of more of an insight in how the Elder Council could function by the fourth era around the time of Skyrim and I think it could be fun to share my speculative fiction on how the council could work by the time of Skyrim so what comes now is not really canon but just me interpreting what we have in terms of lore and trying to connect the dots and make it into a political system reflective of the few things that we know like the council being more of a parliament and giving consent for the emperor's rule all right here we go so in my version of events, I gave the current Elder Council 70 members, with an additional 71st member in the Emperor or representative of the Emperor who is allowed to attend all the sessions. The Council operates in a simple majority system, so 36 votes is enough, with the Emperor being able to break a tie when there's a tie. I kinda inspired that one on the US Senate, where the Vice President can, you know, break a tied vote. On my version of the council, there are members from all around the empire who have significant influence. So, for example, these are the rulers of rich and powerful vassal kingdoms of High Rock, the heads of powerful families, which hold sway over the trade in the empire. Uh, the king of Orsinium is, for example, on it. The most influential Jarls of Skyrim, and of course, the high king of Skyrim, and the high chancellor, who is, you know, the chairman of the council, and so on. It's basically a collection of the most powerful people in a the neighborhood. Uh, they aren't really an advising council or governing council, as in the novels. Again, we learn that the Mede emperors have ministers who govern the empire's ministries to help them with governing. So this elder council is more of a parliament with representatives from the most powerful people around the empire and the most powerful places around the empire. Now, the idea is that these people cannot always be in the Imperial City, so instead of a permanent inner council like with the Septims, I envisioned a system where every one of the 70 members has a permanent representative in the Imperial City who sits on the council and votes on their behalf when they are not in the city. This would be by basically somebody they trust, like a brother or sister or close partner, etc. Or they could simply choose to be there in the Imperial City at all times, but a king has more to do. I chose this because it would make the council a more active thing and give remote regions more power, reflective of the Mede Emperors not having a divine right to rule, but rather having to rule as mortal men over mortal men and thus likely having to listen more closely to what their vassals and subjects' wishes are to appease them. As such, permanent representatives made more sense to me with a grand council assembly where every actual member attends two to maybe four times a year to make the most important decisions where every member attends in person. Because in my version of events, the council has quite some power, although that power is kind of unofficial. You see, I kept the veto that the Septim Emperors had for the Mede Emperors, but considering the Emperor's power is now derived from the fact that the majority of council members see him as just, too many vetoes over council decisions, especially over cases where he vetoes a large majority decision, would anger the council and thus anger his vassals and his subjects, who could then just choose not to support the Emperor's policies, or no longer pay taxes, and since the Emperor has no divine right to rule like the Septims, vassals and subjects could far more quickly decide that the Emperor is unjust if he vetoes them enough times, then no longer pay taxes, and if enough other council members do that, and their respective territories and organizations decide to do that, well, the Emperor has a problem since his own empire would fracture. Now, since the Empire in my version does not have a constitution of sorts, where there are formal procedures dictating how the Council has power respective to the Emperor, their powers rest fully on the threat that if the Emperor doesn't do what they want, they will stop paying taxes, stop supporting him, and the Empire would fall apart. Thus making sure that the Emperor listens, be all of this power is unofficial, but still, it's there. Now, in my version of this, I inserted a middleman. You see, the High Chancellor of the other Council has a lot more power in my version. In my books, I made the High Chancellor an orc named Mulwok Gronagorm, which was basically a descendant of Gortwok Gronagorm, you know, the third era king of Orsinium and likely the founder of the fourth era Orsinium. 
In my books, he's an orc who was king of Orsinium until he became too old, but kind of became disillusioned with the whole idea of a worthy dad like most orcs have, like the ones that we can find next to the road in Skyrim. As even as king of Orsinium, he had a bright political mind, and thus when he essentially retired as king, he went to the imperial city and took on the position of high chancellor when it was offered to him by the emperor, who saw in him a valuable ally. I inserted him and his position as a sort of middleman between the emperor and the council, who was tasked with simply ensuring that a crisis where the emperor wants something else than the council doesn't happen and that the council's wishes are adequately taken up with the emperor and that the emperor's policies are smoothed over with the majority in the council before they go to a vote. As such, diverting any crisis where, you know, a majority is against the emperor. As such, he has to be sort of a master of the imperial political landscape and in my books I kind of described him as a spider in the middle of a large political web of owed favors, information and connections. He knows what everybody on the council wants and often helps people achieve their goals to then have favors owed to him which makes his job easier to get imperial policies through as you know, people owe him favors. He is one of my, if not my favorite original characters for my novels and I essentially described him as only second to the emperor in terms of power in the Empire as, well, if he disagrees with the Emperor, what will happen? So yeah, the Emperor kind of has to have a good working relationship with him. But yeah, that's just how I envisioned this whole system. Um, but yeah, again, my version of events and this whole Chancellor guy aren't canon, but considering the information we have, it could very well be how it works and it was fun to speculate. Anyway, I do hope that you learned something as I basically told you everything you need to know and more in speculation for me on the Yellow Council. So, if you learned something, I hope you will consider returning for the next Elder Scrolls lore video. And that being said, all that rests me now is to vocally thank my top Patreon supporters, Mr. Bernardo Binda, Gabriel Binda, Polo Rasputin, Athena Iotis, King Chris, Bolts, Crowd of the Scrolls, Doji, Fenrir, Sword of Bushido, Rakai, and Mr. Christmas. It's thanks to these people and all the others on screen that this channel stays alive, and for that I am very grateful. That said, I hope to see all of you in the next Elder Scrolls lore video. Bye-bye.